Welcome to the distaff and female power. First of all, I have to just say distaff. Let's let's define distaff. So you have a staff or a wand around which wool, cotton, flax, whatever fiber you're spinning is wrapped, just the combed out fibers. And from there you pull it down and you twist it with your fingers. In the olden days, they a lot of times they would twist it against their thigh. You see Egyptian art with that, which I don't have here. Um, but the distaff is a tool. It's a spinning wand, making it easier for that combed out fiber to, to trail off into your hand. And usually a drop spindle of some kind is used. So I'm beginning here. Oh, and, and one last thing. Distaff means flax staff in Anglo-Saxon. So that's where the word comes from. But I'm, I'm starting here in ancient Egypt. This, this is really proto-dynastic pro, proto times. And you will see a lot of references. Clearly, the arrows of Nate are crossed the great mother of the gods in Kemetic philosophy are crossed over something here. You will often see this described as a shield, but I'm convinced that it's a distaff and that she's a, the great cosmic weaver. So it makes sense that that would be an attribute associated with her. As you can see, the arrows are, you know, the, this is not much thicker than the arrows themselves. Uh, here we've got a seal from uh, one of the queens, the early queens, and the symbol of the distaff is associated with her. It's her sign, the gnome in Egypt, where she is the great goddess, uh, uses this emblem as her attribute. And here we see it again. And this very clearly shows the fibers of the flax that they used. And it's tied on because flax, unlike wool, doesn't stick very easily to the top of the staff. And the click beetles here kind of rhyming with the design element that are also associated with this goddess. Here's a, here's a good example of the uh, gnome of Nate that is governed by Nate. This little plow sign here represents, you know, these little statelets that were eventually all put under imperial rule under the pharaohs. But again, even more clearly, not only the arrows, but you've got this mass of spinning fiber to be spun, and you even have a strand of it coming off of there to be pulled into spinning. So um, that, that thing about the shield, there are some examples where there is a shield, but the, the spinning is very much to the fore. So there's different times kinds of distaffs. And in the Mediterranean region, very often you see a very short handheld distaff. You can barely see this one, it's so pale, but if you look closely, there's the mass of wool and then the strand coming down that she then twists with her fingers. She doesn't seem to have a drop sp spindle in this picture. And so they can be very, very short, these Mediterranean distaffs. Here's the fiber wound around it. Here she's got the, the drop spindle in the other hand. And um, also here, this is an example of one of those short distaffs. So they kind of have to hold it up with one hand uh, here again. And so not only in the Greek and Roman world, but also in Syria, we see both the distaff and the uh, spindle in her hand, very small here, just there symbolically to prove this is like a signal. She's a woman, she's a good woman, she's hardworking. And you see that a lot in, in Mediterranean art, especially in the funerary stele. And so they have this in their hand in one way or another. But you also see goddesses. And in, this is a Roman statue of Dea Syria, which is the goddess of Syria or Ator goddess as she was known. There again, the spindle in one hand, not usually held up like that, and the distaff in the other. So these kinds of distaffs also show up in this Jordanian mosaic. And as we can see here, Aphrodite is shown there, her name, and she's got a distaff in one hand and there's no spindle here. It looks like she's just twisting the fiber by hand. And so uh, this is, of course, not originally in, in, in this region. Uh, the Nabataeans or whatever uh, Arab peoples were living in Jordan at that time or Palestinian peoples were not, um, you know, they weren't worshiping Greek goddesses, but this is the Hellenistic period. So this gets adapted over. And it's very common, actually, not only Athena, but to see Aphrodite spinning. With Athena, she's got this dual nature. She's a spinner, she's also a warrior. So a lot of people would look at this distaff and not recognize that's what it's supposed to represent. And again, the short handheld distaff and then the spear. And so she's got both of those going on. 
Here's another example of the short distaff. And this is kind of interesting because the unusual headdress, almost horn that she's wearing here. And then over on this side from Crete, this is about the seventh century BCE. Again, you can see the distaff and then she's actually holding both in one hand, like she's holding them up. And this is again, a funerary Stella. So this, is, this implement is very much associated with women's work. All the weaving that went on was not only a household thing, it was actually an economic powerhouse. Uh, weaving was, weavings were very valuable or were used a lot in international trade. And you have enslaved women also being put to work spinning and weaving in ancient Sumeria, in the Mycenaean Empire, a lot of different places. Symbolically, though, this spinning, and here we see the drop spindle, uh, the three moire, the, the fates, this is a modern picture, but there aren't a lot of images of them from ancient times. I just like this painting. But the idea of twining the fibers of being, and there's this metaphorical use of spinning as an act of creation, as the destining power to the thread of each lifetime. There's a lot of uh, overplay of that of that idea. And also we see cosmologically, uh, Plato writes in the vision of Eir about the spindle of Ananke, whose name means necessity. So she's a very majestic figure here. This is all an illustration that was done 2,500 years after Plato's time, but or almost that much. But you can see the drop spindle there. And it's like the entire cosmos is whirling. And the moire, the fates, are helping to turn these cosmic spheres. And she's presiding over that. So you have a lot of this. I'm going to be writing about this a lot in my forthcoming book, um, especially in the first chapter on the Titanides, the, the goddesses that precede the Olympian gods, the great Titanic women who are the primeval forces of, of nature. So the Romans correspondent to the Moire are the Parcae. And it got here the, spin, the distaff in hand again. Uh, it means those who spare, they're the fates. And in Roman art, very commonly, they, they show up on a lot of funerary stellae where you, this is, looks like it's from a temple. However, again, the, the distaff here, the drop spindle, they um, often are shown holding scrolls representing a written fate. So this is a very much a later literate sp spin on, on the original symbolism of spinning destiny. But here's a good illustration of holding the distaff, and then she will take this hand, draw off a piece of thread, and then once she attaches it to the drop spindle, and it gets kind of anchored there, then she can let this thing just fly, and gravity will pull out the thread, it will extend the thread. And sometimes she gives it a twist up here if she needs to, or kind of like run it between her fingers in order to make sure it's even. But then the drop spindle not only pulls at with gravity, pulls the thread down and, and pulls it long, but also adds a torque to it so that you've got a very tight thread. So there's like two directions of spinning and the spinners and weavers here could probably say more about that, this S and Z uh, curve on there. So this is Gaulish, although it looks very Roman because this was made in Roman times, but we have the goddess of the Seine River standing in a duck boat and spinning. And here again, no distaff. She's just using her fingers. And then you can see she's twisting it here. There probably was a drop spindle as part of this at one time. This is one of the many offerings that were put, placed at the headwaters of the Seine. And the name of that actually comes from Sequana, this goddess. Here's another view of her from the side. So if you just saw this one picture, you would not even twig to the idea that she's spinning. And the duck here has a little berry in its bill. And this may also be a distaff. You notice the kind of, this could just be a wooden carved uh, finial on a staff, but it looks like it could also be a distaff with uh, wool or flax wrapped around it. And Nehalenia is a great goddess in the Low Countries. And there are a lot of these little limestone stelae that were raised to her at Collins Plat and different other places. There's one site where there was a storm, like, I don't know, 100 years ago that, uh, or longer, that pulled all the sand off of the ancient layers and exposed these little shrines 
to this goddess that um, had been hidden for many centuries. And we see distaff holding women in Iberian heart art. This is from southeastern Spain. And, you know, this is something that shows up a lot in, I forgot to put, there's an Elamite painting, or rather relief that shows a woman seated and spinning. This is very common in, in world art, although not everybody is spinners and weavers. But I really love this one. This is a lead plaque from Roman Britain, horned goddess with a distaff there, so a spinning goddess. And it's interesting because the clothing here is very, very archaic looking and off the shoulder cape here, which may even be fringed, you know, some kind of corded vegetal fiber or something like that. This is quite a bit later, maybe six or eight centuries past that time. And we have Mother Earth, giver of life at her breasts, flowers and greenery all growing up around her, including between her toes. And she has this beautiful flax draped distaff in her hand. This is the flow of energy there is really beautiful. So the idea of earth as spinner, goddesses as spinners, as creatrix. And we also look in this same time period, Frankish era of, we see uh, pictures of women spinning and weaving. This is what they call the gynecaeum, the, the women's realm, the women's work area here. And we have various bishops in Portugal, in Belgium, in the borders of Germany and France, and in Spain, talking about ceremonial acts bound up with spinning and weaving. And so ritual observances in Galicia, and this Belgian guy is telling women, don't hang amulets off of your neck, and do not name Minerva or other unpropitious persons, as in goddesses, meaning he thinks they're demons, in their textile work. So he, we're getting information from the priest's mouth themselves that women are, are invoking goddesses in their textile work. And they also are observing omens, superventas means that which comes upon one. So while they're spinning and weaving, you know, if there's a certain moment, there's a call of a crow or something, then they draw omens from that. And then a German penitential about a thousand years ago scolds women for chanting while weaving. So this is something we know from the Carmina Gadelica in Scotland that Gaelic women were doing, Scots women were doing a while spinning or while weaving, they are chanting blessing and protective chants. And some of those have survived where they're saying, may the wearer of the shirt be hale and may he never be wounded or whatever the chant is in order to bless the, the energy that goes into the creation of this, this weaving work is, is faithful, it is blessing. And then this last little piece is interesting in Spain, they were yelling at women for hanging animal amulets off their looms. You know, so this too could have had to do with blessings for the, the animals on their farms, or it could have had to do with animals that were wild in nature. There's a lot, you know, we just have these little fragments, these shards really of cultural practices that the, uh, the high churchmen vouchsafe to us. They give us these, these clues about what the ceremonies look like. Now this here was, it's from England. I think they found it in France, the whalebone casket. And this part right here is what really interests me because I believe this is the oldest representation from Northern Europe of the weird sisters or the fates. And this term weird sisters, weird means fate, destiny. And you'll even see that word being used in Christian writings up to the 1300s, right? But it also as a goddess. And so what may be going on here is this warrior has a fateful encounter with this fairy woman. You know, she has the head of a deer hooves. She's got a flowering branch in her hands. And then at some point he dies and is buried in a barrow in a mound. And so the interpretation goes, this is his stallion who is mourning over his grave. A Valkyrie is standing there with a staff and a cup and welcoming him to the other world. This is an etching I did back, I don't know, 30, 40 years ago. Uh, this is the old spelling that you find before Macbeth writes, uh, before Shakespeare writes Macbeth, the three weird sisters. 
This is from the 1300s. That's how old spelling of weird. And then oh, we also have the, that same concept in the Low Countries, where uh, very closely related Germanic languages to English. So in Old Dutch, we have the Dreisustren or the Dreigesustel in Flemish, the three sisters who are spinners and weavers of destiny. And so when we look at the old goddesses of the pagan world, who, to whom the day of Friday is sacred, who are the guardians of the winter nights, who are spinners, over and over again, we see spinning ceremonies or refraining from spinning work during the holidays of these goddesses. And so there's all these ethnic names for Hola and Northern German speaking regions, Berta or Perta in the Southern ones. We're gonna come back to Berta in a minute and a variety of others. And so these goddesses who fly through the heavens with the witches and spirits and ancestors have this attribute of being spinners. And there, I did this map, I actually have prints of this available of the different places. These are not just goddesses. These are specifically goddesses who are named in relation to the wild ride, the wild hunt, the, the night rides of the witches and spirits with the goddess. And so the queen of elf fame in Scotland, and we have Zivana in Poland, and there's a whole variety of these uh, goddesses, some of whom are named after the winter nights, like here, Quaternica, um, Mari, the goddess Mari. So there's a whole body. I have an article on the Suppress History site called The Old Goddess that talks a little bit about these, these beings and the, the, the tergenda, as they call it in Italian, these, these, these flights through the heavens that they do. Here's an example of flying through the heavens from the Basque country and the goddess Mari spinning there with a drop spindle. And she's flying past one of the mountains. This is probably the mountain of Amboto where she has sacred caves that witches were still gathering in and holding ceremonies still in the middle ages and into the period when the Basque witch hunts begin to mention these gatherings in the 1500s. So uh, this is a pre indo european goddess who has many attributes that rhyme with those of the Indo-European, you know, the Germans, the English, the French, the Italians. And so in the fairy faith tradition, there's a lot about the fates. Uh, the fatas is actually the word that's used that becomes fey in French. And you can see here, a woman is given birth and the fates have come or the fairy women have come to partake of offerings. A table has been laid out for them. And so they're taking these offerings as this says, in order that they may predestinate good things to those who are born there. So women in the Middle Ages are still doing ceremony towards these fateful women. And then you have the bishop scolding and say, well, you know, the good women who go by night with the goddess, these are, uh, people are still praying to them. They're making offerings to them. And these are especially practices by the women, which stands to reason because, you know, the, the spinning and weaving, that's all part of this, the household, housework, the, the offering of food is all part of women's sphere. So this is a very interesting, probably lead amulet that shows uh, perhaps a fate. Notice that uh, this is the low countries. You have the little dog. So there may even be a continuity with Nehalenia. She's got the scroll, probably from the Roman influence. You can see she was worn and she has the distaff with the spindle hanging off of it and some, some herbs there. So wearing a protective image of the fate goddess. Now I'm mostly talking about Europe in this show, but I'm gonna depart from that a little bit because the spindle, not so much the distaff, but the spindle is really important attribute of goddesses in Mesoamerica. So here from Yucatan, the frescoes at Tulum, she's got coming off the back of her cape, which is where usually the attributes of the divinities are shown. You can see that she's got the whole cape is, is hung with very heavily loaded spindles that have already been spin, spun out. And there's some other examples of it over here. She also has knot work in her, um, here's actually some spindles in her headdress as well, which is, as we're going to see, very common. And she's standing on knot work. So it's kind of interesting. 
Here she is again, and it may be hard for you to recognize it, but she's got a spindle here. A lot of both the Mexican and the Maya art, you'll have this, it looks like a price tag coming off of the spindle, but this is supposed to represent cotton. And you can see it also, the midwives here who are praying to Ischel also have this thrust into their head headdresses. So there's this resonance between the goddess herself and then her votaries who are the midwives because birth being one of the mysteries of Ischel is along with medicine and weaving and a lot of other things is uh, something that you know ties together with these, these weaving aspects. And here she's lifting a newborn out of the jaws of a serpent. So coming out of the, uh, from the womb into the, into the, this world, from the other world, Ischel, who is dressed in, in jaguar robes, and so is this priestess here, this midwife. Here again, these now we're looking at Aztec art, and we have the goddess Tosi, which means our grandmother, or sometimes they will call her Tlazoteo, the black paint around her lips is one of her attributes, but we also have the spindles and then the unspun cotton coming out the top of them. And in Mexico, you see very similar to Athena in a way, this combination of weaver and warrior because she's carrying shields, very often has weapons in her hands. She also has a bundle of cattails that were used a lot in Mexican processions. And so here the warrior with weapon in one hand and shield in the other, but she's got the, the spinner's tools thrust into her headdress on both of these. And both have the black painted mouth, which is the attribute of Tlazolteotl herself. And then if we go up into North America, we see uh, this is probably the largest spindle in the world. In fact, it almost looks like a distaff itself because the Salish weavers do this blend of mountain goat wool and combings from little fuzzy dogs and vegetal fibers, and they make the thickest yarn. Very, very heavy yarn. Famous uh, great weavers. Here's some examples of the spindle horals. So this is the horal, and it's a counterweight that you stick onto the spindle. And you can see she's got it kind of tied off at the top in order to keep it solid so that it will can not pull out. But um, here is a modern painting showing the little dogs. They used to keep these dogs on an island and keep them safe from predators for one thing. And they wouldn't shear the dogs. They would just comb out the fluff underneath their fur. And so you can see her with one of these giant spindles that um, she's, she's getting ready to, uh, she's making yarn. Here's an, one of the more archaic forms of the spindle horals. And this is kind of interesting because these kind of look like beavers or something but you've got that turning symbolism. I could do a whole probably show by this time on the symbolism of spindle horals. There's examples from Troy and other places where you've got lots of patterns engraved on the spindle horal because while it's spinning, these patterns are also moving. And so, you know, the spinner can watch that happening. Perhaps it contains a cosmic significance to set that spinning like that. So the constellation that we call Orion after a Greek rapist figure, these three uh, stars in the belt were called in Scandinavia Frigga Rokin, the distaff of Frigga. And sometimes they will say Freya instead. This is modern, but it's, it's based on old plaques that were found, images of, of Norse women. And they've got her there with the distaff and the drop spindle, uh, not based on a historical prototype as such, but modeled after them. But in Maya tradition, these are known as the three hearthstones. So there, there's a lot of different interpretations of these constellations. Now this one, uh, she's spinning from a, a drop spindle here. And I found something out about this recently because I was interpreting this as a scene of witchcraft, that she's using spinning, but you know, what is the story with this wand that's burning in her mouth? So I found out that in the far north where nights are so long, this was as the equivalent of kind of a flashlight that people moving around, she had her hands taken up so she couldn't really be carrying a candle. They would light these wands, maybe dipped with pitch at the end, and that would be the light. So she's got a whole lot of potential lights here tucked into her 
or into her belt. Here's some examples of Roman a distaff from a museum with the little spindle whorls down the bottom, but also Egyptian distaffs. And this form here is, as you can see, very ancient. Uh, we're going to see this a lot in, in what I'm about to show you. There's like often a central disc, and you've got these kind of spokes, which they re refer to as a birdcage distaff. And this is meant to be an easy way to wrap the flax or the wool around so it stays put. When you pull off of it, the whole thing doesn't come slipping down. And so when I was working on my book, The Witches and Pagans, I discovered a lot of evidence of women who were buried. They were very clearly Vüller, which means staff women. This is a name for the Norse seeress thousand years ago. And I could not figure out, this is a very unusual shape, but it has to signify something because it was so, the pattern was so definite. And then I found a Norse archaeologist who solved the puzzle. He said, these are shaped like distaffs. And I began Googling distaffs. And then I began to find these shapes turning up. This one here is a reconstruction of this, which is torqued from spending a thousand years in the icy soil of Sweden, you know, across all the seasons of hot and cold. And so here's some more examples of these birdcage types. The spokes have broken off on a lot of these, but you can see that they were originally shaped like that one. And so you can find these Sweden, Norway, Denmark, this Danish one, especially very amazing because the spokes actually torque around. They, they, they're like spirals and they've applied some kind of red to it that might be cinnabar, maybe rather than uh, red ochre. I would guess cinnabar, poisonous, but it gives you good red. And so the thing was that this is what blew my head off is that the wand of power, which is referred to in Icelandic sagas, is shaped like a spinner's wand. And this tied together with everything else I had found about the goddesses, the old goddess of the fates, the Friday goddess, pagan goddesses that were associated with the witches, uh, the fates, uh, Norns, weird sisters, all of this stuff about spinning is now actually showing up here too with these, you could call them shamanistic women, you know, these trance priestesses who were the prophets of North society. And so it's very significant that they had the shape of, these are all distaffs here. Here's an example from Norway with that basic shape. So you can just sort of see the close resemblance but this one is of iron and it was buried with, with, with a vula, vulva with one of these shamanic women. So here's the one I showed you before. You can see how, how twisted it is by the elements. And this is a reconstruction of it that you can see the spokes very clearly here, what they're calling the bird cage. And with a close up, you can see that the spokes are actually emerging out of the jaws of bears or possibly wolves. So it emerges from there and then they swallow it back up again. Very magical. It's a little house on top. But in the burial itself, you have, this is on Klinta on Ullen Island. There's a lot of ash here because they burned everything. And so in a lot of offerings, and I think this was a ship burial, if I remember correctly, but they placed across the top of it, this is the staff caked here with... Uh, ashes. So it was placed here as almost like a protective barrier to uh, protect what was inside the grave. Here's the house that comes at the very top of the staff, bronze, and they think these are bears at either end, which would chime with the fact that it looks like there's bears' heads further down on the staff. But not all of them have the birdcage shape. You also find these polygonal studded pattern, still with those jaws of bears, though. And a lot of these you can see are really deformed by the weather. Here's another one with the studs. This one was found in Russia. I have a lot of these as illustrations in witches and pagans. This one, the spokes are gone. They probably just rusted off. And what they've done, you can see several of these have a very sharp um, uh, squared off shape to them. What they've done is they've torqued the bottom of it as if to say, you know, this is not to be used anymore. It's going to the grave with this dead woman who was our prophetess. So, you know, don't use this. It belongs to the ancestor. 
And so Birka is a big cemetery of Norse times. You can see the date there. That is west of Stockholm. And the, these, these drawings I'm showing you are reconstructions of what was in there. You can see here, this is the studded one with the bear heads that I showed you before. Uh, you can see they're very corroded from being under the snow. Here's the reconstruction where it's laid across her lap. She's just laid out flat. You can see, as was true for medieval women, they have a lot of their tools. They would just wear them off their belt. Their keys, their scissors, their knives, their pouches, including their medicine bags. Here's another one where she's seated. She's got the the Vuller staff in her hands, and she's kind of hunched over there, a chest there with offerings for her. And so another name for this, they called Vuller, which is where the name Vulva comes from, a staff woman, but also Sedstaffer, which means the staff of trance. And so these are witches' wands. We can look at them that way, but they're also shamanic staves, and I'm going to mention that in a second. Now, here's another one where you can see the Vuller wand here, but this one is not so uh, enjoyable to me because either she died at the same time as her husband or else she possibly was killed to be buried with him. You know, so the, the thing about the, the Vuller is that they are powerful public figures, very highly respected figures of influence in their society, but it's also a very patriarchal society. These are the Vikings, you know, they're, they're slavers. It's, uh, it's very, very sexist in many ways. So we have these paradoxes in a lot of cultures where a female sphere of power remains in the spiritual realm, especially, whereas, you know, in the household, the women can be uh, dominated under patriarchal systems. So I'm going to show you two reconstructions here of the Firkat Siris from Denmark. And this one shows her, there's a wooden staff and there is this other thing. One of the, one of the things that, that when you see the archeologists interpreting initially these staffs, they assumed that they must be meat cooking spits because you know, women, women cook. And this is actually a meat cooking spit. So here is one, but here is her said staffer that's there between her legs. And again, corroded. But also she had all these amulets. And you can see this artist has shown some of them, including this swan-footed amulet. And they're not even sure exactly was that hanging from her belt, which is how we see it in this reconstruction. Uh, again, many different kinds of tools that would have been hung from her belt. And especially a pouch. So here it's shown on her belt. Here it's shown on her lap. This is another reconstruction of the same burial and uh, drinking horns. But inside this pouch were over a hundred henbane seeds. So you have plants of the Datura family, which were notoriously asso associated with witches and flying ointment. In fact, uh, these, these Datura plants, uh, aconite, I'm not sure if that's the same as henbane, it's closely related, uh, is called hecates in Greek. So it was associated with, with hecate and the, the herbal pharmaca of, of the Greek witches and herbalists, healers. Okay, so now this one at Veka in Norway. Again, the reconstruction. This is what her staff looked like. But she's actually riding on her staff like a witch's broom. And here you can see it a little more closely. She's got it between her legs with her hand around it. And not only do we have the witch's broom, which shows up in art from the 1400s, on all the way to up to the present time in European art, but also in North Asia and the Siberian shaman culture, they had staves which were often horse-headed that were ridden. They would they would dance around with that staff between their legs as if they were riding a spirit horse. And so there's a lot of connection across North Asia and through Eurasia into Scandinavia, cultural linkups that are going on there. Here's a reconstruction of Thor Björk, who is also called Little Vulva, the, the small Vulva, from Erik Sagarauda. And this is in the 1300s, a saga from Greenland. And so they visualized her with one of those uh, Seidstaffer in the form of a distaff, uh, going by the description of her robes 
as they're described in, in the saga. And she is going from village to village and received with great honor by each family who gives her a feast. And then she does, goes up to the, to the high seat and leads a ceremony and then prognosticates how it's going to be for the coming year. Because in Greenland, that colony failed ultimately. They starved. They're trying to farm in the far north. It wasn't working out well for them. And so it was a great, great import to know, was the harvest going to work out next year? And so she had this very important role in her society. We see the Norse also bringing Seistafer into the uh, Britain, Ireland. Here's the Isle of Man. And you've got a person in a bird costume. The bulk of these Völler were female. And she has a staff in her hand that has looks like it has little jingles hanging below it, which here's an actual example of one and uh, from Hoppestad in, in Norway. So they may have also shaken the staff as a, as a percussion instrument. Here's another example of a very corroded staff. It's almost down to nothing that was found in um, Sweden. And you can see a lot of them are really, you know, suffered from the elements. Some have bulbs on the top of them. So now I want to come over to the legendary or the mythic stories about spinners. And we've all heard the stories about the fairy godmothers who come to aid the maiden, who was usually given a task of spinning a whole room full of flax or wool or whatever they may be using, that they're going to be her fateful helpers that will also guide her to a good destiny. But before we come into those stories, I want to look at a tradition that comes among the Franks on the borders between Germany and France. And there are proverbs that survived into the 1800s. Uh, this one, autant ou Bert filet, the time when Berta span. This is a time imaginably long ago. And here's a version in Provençal, the same thing. D'autant ove Berta filava. They have this proverb also in Italian, one form or another. And so these are medieval portraits of Queen Berta. So there's a couple different strands about her. But um, very commonly, the folklore calls her Berta pedoc, which means the swan-footed or the goose-footed Berta. And you can see there, she's got one natural female foot and the other side she's got this goose foot and so she has this goose aspect to her and she was carved in the 1100s into the doorways of cathedrals along with other male luminaries but she's got that that swan foot these were all destroyed but they survived into the 1600s 1700s you see engravings of them from the 1800s and then they're gone the priesthood as it begins in ever more intense campaign against pagan goddesses removes them. They actually delete them from these stone doorways. But you can see in all cases that she's got one regular foot and one swan foot. And she's also known as a spinner and a storyteller. She is said in some cases to be the grandmother or the ancestor of Charlemagne. So there's other overlays to the story, but you know, being placed at the doorway there is a very prominent position. And so they, they, they destroyed her, eventually destroyed her. Now these motifs also show up in folk stories that eventually become apocryphal saints. And these are usually peasant girls. And there's often a story about male violence wrapped into it where uh, a lord attempts to rape her and she calls out for protection and she is rewarded with one of her feet turning into a goose foot, which therefore freaks out the rapist and he runs away. And so Sant Neome, Neomadi, Numadia, there's a whole bunch of variants on this name, but she's often also shown as a spinner. And so there's the distaff and the spindle horl. Um, Berta is also pictured over and over again with the distaff. And in fact, I couldn't get a picture of this, but a French folk folklorist named Charles Sebillon in the 1800s refers to men menhirs, which are the megalithic standing stones, which were called after the fairy Berta or Lady Berta 
or Berthe au Grand Pied, which in French, Berthe Pédoc is another, another form of that, the big-footed Berthe in this case. And they have places called Berthe's Rock. So there are all these folkloric place names uh, or names for ancient Neolithic monuments that are attached to this figure. This is a very normative one. She's Queen Berta, and she's very domestically showing the girls how to spin flax. But then there's this other side of her. And what did I want to say about that? There was one more piece. Oh, I'm going to come back to the fact that she's also famous as a, a spinner who tells stories. So we'll revisit that. All right, then we've got this whole series of humorous figures of the spinning sow that show up in uh, illuminated manuscripts, often books of hours. And these are kind of, you know, entertaining figures, but they're also carved into churches. This one actually is in Britannia. So the sow with the distaff carved in there. There's a lot of prints. This one's in, written in German. And you can see, you can tell this is flax because of the way the fringes hang down. Wool is like a cloud, but flax is those vegetal fibers that are, are they need to be kept straight. And so it's much harder to spin facts, splat, <laughs> flax. But there, the drop spindles are here and they're also winding it off on a nitty knotty. So there are a lot of these kinds of images. And I believe I might have one also from Russia, but I didn't put it in this show. But this is the center of gravity of this is in France. The sow who spins, that says. But And here she is in another book of ours. So all kinds of, of animals and monsters and strange creatures get uh, painted into the margins of book of ours is like for wealthy people, they would have like their breviary, you'll see it referred to also, which has Christian verses. But around the edges, there are spinning sows, there are spinning bears, other kinds of creatures, spinning monkeys, wearing a veil of a woman. Also again here, flax. The flax has to be tied on. You don't necessarily have to tie wool. We'll see examples of that later. Or even a woman spinning while seated on a, a sow. Or the woman who is spinning is herself some kind of a monstrous being, chimeric being, who is part dragon and part woman. Good example of how she pulls the, the thread down to be spun. And then in Eastern Europe, the types of distaff are different. Instead of a pole, they actually have a whole plank that is usually richly carved. And so she's pulling off of this and then spinning onto her drop spindle. In Russian, they call this a pryalka. And also these rushniki, I want to point out, the icon corner in every peasant home in Russia always had these embroidered, they call them towels, they call them ceremonial towels, but they're not really used to wipe your hands. They are placed in the icon corner, they are placed over newborns, over the dead, uh, on people during marriages, the, over loaves of bread that are being offered to guests. There's a whole lot of, they're sacred. And the, the embroidery very often has goddess figures on them. But this is what the Priyalki look like. And you can see they have this cosmological signs engraved on them, especially these whirling spirals. Also sometimes floral motifs. So these little pegs across the top were to catch the, they use a lot of flax in Russia, I don't know about wool, and hold it. So it's kind of like spikes to um, hold it. And then the flax can, can come down from there. And these kinds of distaffs are also known in Finland, neighboring country, different designs. But you'll see those six-pointed stars showing up quite a lot, including here. And this is Lithuania. And so here, the spinning wheel, we've got a couple loaded spindles already spun off there. But here's the distaff. So there's just a very elaborate lacy carving, and they would have wrapped the, the wool or the flax around it for the spinner to use on the wheel. As you can see, some of these distaffs, you have the tree of life, you have sacred wheels, you have invoking figures with little heart cutouts, actually a whole goddess figure here as well. Another one here, little stars, serpents, more wheels, serpents, more wheels, flowers, and little tiny goddess figure there. So as Maria Gimbutas really has shown us, there's this intense survival of very strong female sacred symbolism 
in Lithuanian culture in general, and especially around spinning, which is an attribute of Lima, the goddess of fortune. Now we sometimes see those other shapes and even the, the, the floral motif, the, the six pointed star also on the French distaff, the canouille, but also other types. These are actually Spanish. They call them rueca, which is related to when we saw Freya roca, Friga roca, same, same root. We're gonna see in a minute from Sardinia, but um, bird, bird cage type spindle uh, distaffs, but also this form where they just take a branch and then they lop the wool around it. And you'll see items like this in some of the witch hunt period. Uh, see witches carrying uh, things like this that we don't necessarily recognize as being distaves. Here's some examples from Greece. So longer than the ancient style that I showed you before. And then again, in their mythic dimension, the act of spinning as working with the fibers of being, a connection to the cosmic source. And there's all this spiral symbolism that pervades that idea. And so this is a beautiful piece of, of glass painting. I'm, I'm forgetting the woman's name. I should put it in here. Old woman in a cardigan with the cosmic spindle. And she's pulling out these fibers from the universe, which we see that concept also, this image of the fates by the um, mystic, painter Elihu Vedder. And in the foreground, you see uh, the distaff, the spindle, the shears, all the tools of working the, the uh, working fiber. But here they're pulling fibers out of the cosmos. So there's this, this, you know, as above, so below dimension to this. Now here is the, 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 the word roca comes up again in Sardinian. So what we're looking at here is a nuraga, which were defensive towers that were built during the Bronze Age, somewhere around 1500 BCE. And some of them are called Nuraga Istria, which means witch's tower. And one of the stories talks about a witch goddess or a fairy woman called Lugia Rajosa, who lived in the Nuraga. And inside of this was all kinds of wealth, animals, jars of grain and oil. And it was defended, this wealth, by her enchanted distaff, the Roca Fatata. And so this distaff would move around during the day when Lugia is sleeping, and she would whistle to warn her when intruders were coming. And so there are these stories about young men who come to try and rob her animals or her firewood. And so she fought them and she defeated them, but one day, a one pushed her magical distaff into the oven. And so then she is undone and she turns into cicada and flies around amongst the Nuragi towers. And so they sort of do away with her mythically. And yet there's this presence that is, you know, that's connected to these very ancient monuments. So before we were talking about Berta and the, the goose or the swan symbolism. And of course the English mother goose descends from stories, and then later a book about this, Conte de ma mère loi, the, the story, stories of my mother, the goose. And so she doesn't have any goose attributes here. She's sitting here with a spinning wheel and a distaff, but she's telling stories to a rapt audience near the hearth. And so that that's something we can see that was published at the end of the 1600s, but a much, much older theme and here again, coming back to Queen Berta also, she's a storyteller. So the children are sitting and listening to her and she is spinning and, and speaking. And I did, I should probably put a mother goose in here, but I'm not sure if I have her with, with a distaff or not. There are other stories though, and this is back to the fairy godmother in Northern England, they talk about Habitrot. And the girl is crying because she is her mother has promised the prince that she she just loves to spin and so he gives her a whole room full of fiber that has to be spun and she's just crying and oh what am I going to do down by the stream and she picks up a hag stone which is a stone a river rock with a hole in it natural hole and she looks through it and she sees habitrot coming down the path toward her oh what's the matter dearie don't worry we'll get it sorted for you and so she comes and she spins off all this stuff. And so then the girl is going to marry the prince. And he says, I have nothing better than the sight of a woman spinning. 
So this very domestic theme, right? And these stories are, you know, marriage is women, is the fate of the girls in so many of the stories. So there's that. But anyway, Habitrot saves her from being humiliated if he's going to sit there and try to make her spin because she's no good at it by coming to the wedding. And he goes, grandmother, why is your lip so long? Oh, from licking thread, from licking thread. Why are your thumbs so big? Oh, from twisting thread, from twisting thread. Why are your feet so big? From treading the spindle. So this story is all over the place. And we have the same theme going on in this Spanish story. Uh, here she is sitting on a pile of wool and they're just spinning away. They love it. But they're also fateful beings because they guarantee this good marriage to her. So there's that side to it. But the same thing, the big thumb, the lip and the foot come into this. And that reminds us of Bigfoot Bert, this, this idea of the large foot associated with this spinner somehow. And there's a lot of other medieval figures. And we have the economic reality that the main way that women could make money, unless they were able to brew, was to spin. This was like your ultimate uh, piecework, sweatshop kind of labor, only in the home. And so, you know, little girls at a very young age put to work producing thread for the, what had now already become an industrialized fabric industry in the big cities where uh, men are starting to weave on machines. But uh, we have lots of medieval art showing that women are still doing this work, especially on the spinning side. And we even have the House of the Distaff here in Southern Germany. And look at this poor, I mean, this is the ultimate multitasking. The man doesn't really carry very much. He's not doing anything but riding along. She's got a baby cradle on her lap, all the household goods hanging off her back and on her head. And she's spinning from a distaff while traveling on this mule. So um, I'm going to show you some examples later of, of women walking and spinning because that's very common. But then we've got more of the humorous story. So the nun here is spinning. There's a big distaff, stationary one. And then the cat playing with the twirling spindle, which is a real thing. They like anything that moves like that. And there's a whole group of spinning saints that show up in folklore. A lot of times Virgin Mary is shown uh, spinning because they're picturing all these kind of genre images of you know the infancy of Jesus and here she is working in the household and so she's spinning and there's also an overlay there because sometimes she is a creator figure even in Christian art and so here you have Mary spinning the life thread and you get that she's pregnant she hasn't given birth yet to Yeshua but she's spinning with the distaff there again stationary one and uh, the drop spindle but somehow this is connected with the life of the child that's developing inside of her. So again, that thread of life symbolism. Eve is very commonly shown spinning with a distaff in various paintings. The, these are Psalters. So again, breviaries with Christian hymns. And I really like this figure here a lot. She really looks like she could hold her ground. But often you've got the pairing of Eve spinning and Adam with some form of agricultural tool in his hand. This goes back to the biblical line about, you know, you shall labor by the sweat of your brow. However, in the 1381 peasant revolt in England, there was a saying, Watt Tyler, Tyler's revolt, when Adam delved, Doug, right, and Eve span, who was then the gentleman? And basically saying, look, we're all the same. We'll come from the ultimate same ancestor. So what is it with this aristocratic ship? And then there's a whole bunch of different French uh, saints that have a magical distaff. So this really comparable to the Sardinian story that I shared with you. And Germaine de Pibrac is one of them. Now, I see some accounts that refer to her living in the 1500s, but uh, it seems like this is an older story than that. So you see her a lot shown with her flocks. And she is a poor girl. Uh, she's disabled. Uh, and she has uh, various, various ailments. And her mother dies when she's really young. So she's abused and starved by a cruel step stepmother. And she has to go out and work as a shepherdess. And so like Lugia Rejosa, she puts her distaff in the ground. And it watches over sheep while she devoutly goes off to mass. And yet she never loses a lamb. And, you know, the wolves don't get it. The foxes don't get it. 
And so the story about the giving the bread to the poor is she was taking bread from her house to give away to the, the impoverished. And her stepmother comes along and says, what do you got there in that, that, that apron? And so she opens it up and miraculously there are roses inside of it. So uh, she's not caught after all. And so she dies young. And then they say they dug up the crypt later on where she was buried in the church. And they found that she was incorrupt, standard Catholic narrative. And so she is made into a saint. But the thing about this story is that this painting of her dates a lot earlier, like by at least two or three centuries than that story about the 1500s. And yet she's there on the hillside with her flock and is spinning. I don't know what the story is about this soldier, but um, she looks like she can hold her own. And then coming back again to Berthe, you have, of course, the mythic ancestral Berthe of you know the, the, the one whose time of spinning was long ago before any of us could even imagine. And then we also have several Saint Berthe the, the, the saints from like the 6th century, 7th century. And so here's the 1600s account about how she uh, is denting the stone and she places her distaff there. She strikes with her distaff into the rock and a fountain pours forth, which becomes a stream. And then she is able to um, draw the waters to her convent from where the spring is and thus create a water source for her community. So there's a lot of legends like this and very often it involves striking either with a distaff or some other staff and the rock splitting and water coming out from it. I don't know anything about St. Catherine of Cleves so I don't know what her story is, but there she is, spindle and distaff. And then there's another very interesting saint who is mainly grounded in Sweden, Finland and Germany a kakukila, a whole variety of different forms of that name. I'm not going to go into that. They think that it might have actually derived from an Irish missionary of the fifth or sixth century, Colum Killa. So I don't know, but she is a protector from rats and mice, which you see down here around her skirts. And sometimes they're climbing up her distaff. And so here she is. This is in Sweden. And then here's an example similar to that, uh, St. Gertrude of Nivelle in Belgium, who becomes the, she's the patron saint of cats. So I guess that's the idea that she's driving out rats and mice. But still the spinning aspect is present in all of these images of her. Now in Russia, they also had apocryphal saints who basically were goddesses in disguise. And so from a Greek saint named Paraska, the Russians came up with a goddess who they usually call her Paraskeva Pyatnitsa, Paraska of Friday. But she has two forms. So she's either Paraskeva Gryaznaya, which means the dirty or the earthen Paraskeva, or she is Paraskeva Lenyanitsa, the flaxen. And that's the form of her who is a spinner. So she has a mother earth side and then also the, the spinner side. And this is one of the most powerful most popular saints in Russian culture. You can see some of these are quite old, the carvings of her. And Friday is sacred to her, like the other uh, Friday goddesses I was talking about. Uh, in Estonia, they actually call her Saint Friday. But underneath this, lying behind Paraska, is Makosh, whose name means moisture. Uh, and she is a cosmic spinner, spinner, but she's also associated with the waters. And this is modern. So you, there's a whole revival of Russian pagan themes and bringing back Makosh, who is often shown in the tree of life as a spinner or here in the clouds. Uh, here, Kostroma is my idea about who is represented here, who is kind of a demonized flax goddess, kind of along the lines of Baba Yaga. In England, there was St. Distaff's Day. So the winter nights being sacred to the old goddess starts with, in the old calendar, it would be the onset of the winter solstice. And you go through these 12 nights, which they call the Tolven in, in German. And it winds up to the Feast of the Epiphany on January 6th. So 12 nights, and then the, and the Feast of the Epiphany is the big blowout. And then after that, it's back to work because the goddess does not want women to spin during that whole period of time. So all the women 
it's a good omen to just finish spinning everything off of the distaff and having the distaff empty at the beginning of the 12 nights. And then after that, you can resume, resume work on St. Distaff's Day. But there's a whole carrying on that goes on. Lots of horsing around, jokes, people playing practical jokes and dancing around because it's kind of a humorous return to the work cycle, which was very laborious. We also have L'Evangile de Quenouille, the Gospel of the Distaffs. And this is you know, written by men. It's kind of satirizing the superstition of women, but a lot of overlay to, to folk uh, custom and the way that this is all intertwined with spiritual themes. And so you will see in medieval manuscripts, the very often represent the fates in uh, terms of the uh, Greek moire. So we've got Clotho the spinner, Lachesis the measurer, drop spindle there, and then Atropos is the, the death aspect. She cuts the thread. And so um, here it says of, of three goddesses, uh, fairy goddesses, which according to the poet are or, ordaining the life of humans. Here they are again, and they actually have those names. So there's no mistaking. We mean the Greek Moira, it's a lot less threatening than naming the French ones. And they're standing on the earth goddess, which is all flowering around. And then here again, this one shows Astrologia in the background. Here's Clotho with a gigantic spindle, Lachesis, and then a tropo is shown as a Medusa breaking the thread. So traditions in the folk culture, even through the 1800s, women are still spinning and there are these combinations of pagan animacy that get wrapped into this. So, you know, the old woman believes in witch stones and Ola sets one aside her spinning jenny. So, you know, there's a blessing power there associated with that. But then there's the demonization. And so in the witch hunts, we see the witch associated. You can hear the old witch is often the most considered to be the most evil seductress of, of this whole uh, projection of devil worship that the Christians make on it. But she's got this gigantic distaff with an owl sitting on it. And then you have the, the sexualization. There's a lot of witch porn of, of women rubbing themselves with poles and all kinds of, you know, you, you, you've heard these stories probably. I don't want to go into depth in that. But in the broadsides that the printers start handing out during the witch hunts, you know, they're making money. Actually, it's kind of the scandal sheets of the day. This is the basic target is a poor old woman. This is the most commonly accused group, not that no one else is ever accused, but the hunts often start with a woman like that. And it says here, burned as Hexen or Unholden. Unholden is a, a demonologist rewrite. The term originally was Holden, which means the beneficent ones. And so now they're saying, no, no, these are the bad, these are the bad spirits. They, they're, they're harmful. So everything gets reversed out. The spinner here with her giant distaff is she has great power in her spinning. So she's in tune with the cosmic forces, the stars and the moon. She can cause terrible blasting hailstorms that destroy the crops. So she's evil is the message here of this power. And she's also associated with henbane, which is growing here. It's one of the witch's herbs. So there's a, a complete reconstruction of this female power associated with the distaff now being wrapped into the demonological stories that are being told and actually mass produced through these woodcuts. So here she's sitting on a spinning bench. This would be one of the stationary distaffs that's stuck into the spinning bench. But this one, she's got it kind of with a flag attached to it. There's that same kind of stick with forks in it as the distaff. Brewing storms, all those other things. Uh, riding backwards on the goat. Everything has to, everything the witches do as well as the fairy world sometimes is backwards. So, you know, in, in the summer, they're, they're doing the things that should be done in the winter, all of that. But blasting storms and then the distaff uh, combined along with it. Here they are again, flying on the backs of hounds and pigs in the presence of the devil who's dressed up like a Renaissance uh, uh, war chief. And Berta herself, gets really made in 
to a disgusting figure who's drooling snot and is going around snatching children and putting them in the basket. And you can see she's a poor old hunchback woman. Her clothing is in tatters, really representing the condition of a lot of women in those times. And little girls are all screaming and running away to escape from her. But in one hand, she has a pole with a lamp. In the other hand, she has a very long distaff. Also, Baba Yaga, once again, riding on the pig. She's got a carding tool stuck into her belt. She has a shuttle rather than a distaff in one hand as her weapon here fighting the corcodil, a male monster figure. And so this combat aspect of the distaff as a weapon for women, a symbol of female power, and especially the power to emasculate men, to feminize men. And um, this, this is a story that begins with the Greeks, where Heracles, having murdered a bunch of people, is given penance. He is to work as a slave for Queen Omphal of Lydia. And so he has to dress in female clothes and be humiliated by forcing him to do women's work. So she's sitting there in his clothing. The lion skin is now on her. He's in the female robes and she has his club. So it's a world upside down theme. Everything is reversed. Male power is being feminized here. And this is the Renaissance artists are really into this. So the women are handing the distaff here and Heracles is supposed to spin. And when he makes mistakes, then they beat him. So these stories get carried on from the ancient Greeks from a couple thousand years before, and they, they, they survive. Some of the figures are humorous, but you've got the monk here with the distaff and the dancing nun, but you see the weapon, especially the idea of the woman beating the man with the distaff. He's utterly powerless before her. So there's a lot of overlay of the idea of witch power here that the distaff is not just some kind of ordinary weapon, but that is actually uh, has magical power behind it. And we see that really clear here. This is truly an emasculating distaff because she's wielding it as a weapon with the spindle flying out behind. She's flying through the air. Part of her is shape-shifted into a serpent, but she is making this man castrate himself. And he's actually putting his sword in through the anus. So there's a whole idea of homosexual sex also um, written into here. But look at the date on that. So this continues on for several hundred years. And you've got the peasant woman beating up on the green man here, very phallic figure in this piece. And, you know, the anger of women is something that's highlighted in this art. Now, what we have to understand, these are very heavily alcoholic cultures in which men would go off, spend off the money that really belonged to the family, come home and beat the women. And there was just, it was endemic, this kind of battering. But what this art is giving us is a complete mirror reversal where really it's the woman who's henpecking her husband, who's riding him, who's even forcing him to spin and doing things that really are not the proper sphere of men. So there is a reversal of the gender hierarchy of patriarchy here. And it's actually literally a reversal. Look at him, he's standing on his head, but she's riding on him. In this case, she's spinning, but he has to hold the distaff. He's completely dominated by her. Or she's riding on a detached penis. And there's a lot of stories. If you've ever read the Malleus Maleficarum, they have stories about witches who are detaching and collecting penises in boxes. So literally castrating witches. And here she's riding on top of it. So she is spatially dominating it. Um, here we have also the jousting theme. And so both the man and the woman are using distaffs instead of lances as their weapons. Well, here, only the woman has the distaff and the knight, who is ordinarily at the very top of the social hierarchy as man and as lord, is uh, weaponless and he's pleading for mercy. So again, the usual dominator and committer of violence is made into the victim of women's power. And so these are reversal stories that were very, very popular. And again, we see them showing up in, uh, in Christian scriptures. Here, she's got a real lance. His is broken. So again, the idea, she's going to win. Poor him. You hear the wild woman and the wild man 
jousting. He has a rake, she has a distaff. So again, that gender division of, of labor that we saw before. And here she's using the distaff perhaps at, as a weapon, but it looks to me as if she's sending off this spirit being who is kind of a chimeric creature made up of different kinds of animals. Here's our monkey again, monkey with distaff and jousting on the backs of pig and bear. So the same animals seem to recur in relation to uh, spinning themes. And so lots of images of them as weapons. Here she's lifting her skirt, which is referring in this, in this Jewish scripture uh, to the idea of showing the vulva as another form of female power. I don't know what the story is with the snail, but it appears in several of these scenes. Or they are part woman and part animal. And there's a combat between two of these spirits using distaffs as weapons. And here's one more with the detached penis, the woman wielding the distaff, and the cat is running away with the dick. So um, forcing the man to, to spin again. Now this leads into another theme, which is called the battle over the breeches. So you can see she's starting to put on, breeches were actually a, a garment that men wore over their hips. They had these long stockings that they wore and it was a garment that was just kind of intermediate between the top and the bottom. So she's like, no, I will wear the breeches, meaning I'm going to dominate and I'm going to make you do the spinning. And so here's the breeches in the foreground and he is overcome by her power. She's beating on him with the distaff, with the assistant. And here again, the magical element comes in of the dragon spirit, which is often connected, especially in German art, with the powers of the witch. And that dragon is helping her to dominate him in a, in a magical way. So who's going to wear the pants? Poor, unfortunate man being dominated by a woman who is actually larger than him, as well as having her witchy powers. And there's also themes of homosexuality. So he's displaying his bare buttocks while holding the distaff. He's kind of smiling invitingly there. And so that theme is also going on, the emasculated man. And here are women with distaffs as weapon, attaching a man who's on the ground, ganged up on this poor helpless man. But you know, remembering that really it's the women that's being battered in these European societies. And so that world upside down theme here, it, it's surviving into the 1700s. He's sitting there with a baby in his lap and the spinning tools. She's got the gun and the sword and is smoking. And so the battle over the breeches, uh, here are the actual pants in the 1800s. She's fighting him with the distaff. And no, I want the pants because the pants, the male garment symbolize domination in the home. And so there's a lot, a lot of art representing this, right? Here he's being forced to put the breeches on her and she's scolding and shaking her fist at him. And so female domination with the distaff always in view all over this art. Here again, putting the pants on the woman. With the joker the coming in there through the door. So the battle of the breeches. And then there's another aspect to this because as folk theater, the Charivari in France or what they call the Skimmington in England, men would periodically put on these theatrical processions. And very often it was a man who was believed by his peers to be pushed around by his wife. So if they thought he was a henpecked husband, then he would have, they would put him on a mule seated backwards and there'd be a man dressed up as a woman impersonating the woman and, and saying, you know, in a falsetto voice, telling him, you know, work, you dog, work, you know, and, and dominating him. And then they would have pots and pans and make a big racket. And this would, procession would go through the village. And uh, basically a theater of male domination. And so um, sometimes they would do it to batterers as well in order to shame them. But the main target, the main theme of this is you can see very well here, a man in drag, uh, the theme of, of a woman dominating a man and how this community will not stand for that. They will ridicule it. And so this goes on over and over. 
So, you know, she's ordering him to work because really there's a lot more male leisure than there is female women's or women have too much to do. And he's saying, I'll wash your clothes. I'll clean your house. And he's got that distaff in his hand. We also find the fates showing up as spirits here. This isn't from the 1800s. And they come and they do spinning in order to cause a fate to happen for the young maiden. And so that's back to that idea of spinning connected to uh, destiny, which is marriage within patriarchal European culture. And you also have the custom of having spinning parties in, parties in the evenings. This one is from southwestern France, but this is known all the way over into Czechoslovakia. And then young men would come according, and they would be courting the women while they're singing and spinning together. So finally, uh, here's an example of the birdcage type distaff. This technology survives into the 1900s in some of the rural areas. We also see it showing up in this engraving from the 1700s in Brazil. And so here she's got her distaff. This is the interior of a household of vendors selling some kind of something to the lace maker here. But that I want to just give a brief glimpse of spinners in other parts of the world. So here we have the very loaded spindle and, you know, periodically they have to wrap it around and fasten it again and then continue spinning. But it looks like she's spinning out of a plastic bag because they don't always have a distaff. This spinner does in Peru, this classic distaff. But a lot of times they have the, the thread already kind of prepared. I mean, the, the combed out uh, fibers probably alpaca in this case, or llama. And they're spinning just with that little pile of fiber or they wrap it around their wrist just to make it be handy. But here you can see very well how she's pulling it out into a thin strand and then down to the spindle. This looks like really tough going kabuya fiber, whatever that is, a lot more like flax than wool. And so, you know, usually you have to have moisture applied to make these fibers stick together. This is from Ecuador. Guiana, where they're using cotton and using their feet sometimes as a counterweight because there's no there's no distaff here and she's not even really uh, using a drop spindle method. A Navajo spinner again with just the combed out wad, kind of formed into a column there. Uh, two examples of Navajo style spinning. Uh, this is North Africa, the so-called Berbers, the Amazighen. And uh, she does have a distaff in her hand there and the spindle. Also in the southern parts of North Africa, you find women uh, in the Amazigan culture here with the distaff and little feathers stuck into the top of it. And again, wrapped around the hand. This is in Afghanistan. So no, no, no distaff in some of these pictures. Here it is again, wrapped around the arm. In Iran, this one in Tajikistan. I love this picture. And then in West Africa, you have a little stick being used as a distaff in Togo and in Benin Republic. And they just keep adding it onto the stick. Oops. Mali, distaff in hand. And then the Jews in Ethiopia also. I can't really tell if she's got a distaff there, if she's just got a big wad of, of cotton. And then here again in Morocco, uh, Bedouin women, lots of, and, and they are able to spin goat hair. A lot of the tents were made out of goat hair. Not very easy to uh, twine together. But Tibet, this is the Tibetan part of uh, North, West India and Ladakh, Tibetan speaking region. Again, just the pile of wool being used. And then when she comes to the end of it, she takes another pile, she twists it together and attaches it and continues on. Now the spinning wheel was probably invented in India, but it spreads over into China and comes to Europe around the 1400s or so. So a lot of the pictures, this wheel has been in use already for thousands of years. And this is a man. There are some places where men are also doing the spinning. And in this case, in Tibet, he's out herding yaks. 
So, you know, there's not a lot to do there. So he's making himself useful and creating thread. And you'll see these, these pictures of women walking while they're spinning, they're walking. She's even carrying a load of, I don't know what that is, if it's bamboo or what, but uh, again, multitasking on a really big scale. So in the Pyrenees, you see women walking, you know, on the long distances they do across the mountains uh, from village to village using, uh, just bringing along their distaff to work on. And then in Eastern Europe, you often see these really huge piles of um, fiber on the staff. She's holding it in her hand. A lot of times what they'll do is they'll tuck it under their arm to keep it stable if they don't have a fixed distaff like this one. This is in Switzerland, and this is, again, flax, spinning wheel. Britannia, there she is, tucked under her arm. And of course, what happens is the Industrial Revolution comes along, especially after the invention of steam engines. And so in the early 1800s, you begin to have factories with this machinery and child labor very often being used. And a lot of the early labor strikes were led by the mill girls in Massachusetts and Manchester and different places. And this was also part of the whole cotton industry. So this is part of a slavery economy. So you've got exploitation of very poorly paid child labor. We're, we're working incredibly long hours in the mills in the North. And then you have all of this. The cotton, of course, is being produced at the expense of African-Americans in the slave South. Finally, just the last few pieces here with this. This is actually the weaver's sword rather than spinning, but I threw that in there because this imagery of the Norns as weavers, spinners, and as destiny. So the distaff is right there as the fate of the infant is being declared there inside the house. And you continue to see that spinning theme coming up by modern artists with the Norns. And even in our present day, this is an example of the Norns that is a modern sculpture in Northern Denmark. And this is a piece that's based on uh, traditions about the Norns, uh, the names Urverdande Skuld, written in runes, means became, becoming, shall be. So there's like that circle, that spiral of time. And this is interesting because the knot work here reminds me of what we saw earlier on the Maya murals. This is a modern Polish artist revisioning uh, vulva in the Scandinavian witch or seeress tradition with a classical distaff wand in her hand. And then modern women also are doing ceremonies of reclaiming. And so you've got the birdcage type distaffs with wool in them that is for ceremonies at the Vroenbrunn, the women's well in Braschat, Belgium. I visited there, actually, they have a poster on there. So there is a living revival of this. I mean, many women took up spinning and weaving. Again, there's a whole movement of that, but also reclamation of the spiritual significance, the ceremonial aspect of spinning and weaving. 